The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation. Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well-being of older Californians and their caregivers. And supported by listeners like you, many of whom have donated on the Jerry Powell fundraising site, which you can find at www.jerrypowell.org, big blue button, or through reviews, stars on your favorite podcasting app. Big thank you. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? Today, we are honored and delighted to welcome Cheryl Phillips, who is the president and CEO of the Special Needs Plan Alliance and is a geriatrician and former AGS president. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you. Delighted to be here. We're also delighted to welcome back Claire Ancuda, who is a palliative care physician and researcher at the Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Welcome back to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Claire. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you all. And returning as a guest host, Alex Kasbaruk. I, I stumbled on the name Alex. I don't know why. <laughs> Um, who's a geriatrics fellow at UCSF. Uh, Welcome back, Alex. Thank you. Glad to be back. So today, this is our part two of a two-part special on Medicare Advantage plans. We're going to be talking about special needs plans and hospice carve-ins. We haven't done a lot of policy on Jerry Pal, so we're trying to focus a little bit more on some policy and I'm super excited to talk about this stuff. But before we do, Cheryl, I think you got a song request for Alex. I do. So I have a new favorite artist, and uh, her name is Rihanna Giddens. She is a Black both folk singer and poet and focuses on African-American roots to contemporary folk music with her um, partner who does percussion. And if you haven't heard them, they're amazing. And so I toss that to Alex, who is um, hopefully going to figure out how to do one of those. And which song? Did you have a particular song you requested? Um, I am open to, I think it was Purchaser. uh, Purchaser's Option. Yes, exactly. Purchaser's Option. At the Purchaser's Options. This is a song about... So Rhiannon and Giddens um, saw an advertisement in a paper. This is a historical uh, paper from um, N- New England uh, advertising for a slave for sale. And at the purchaser's option, the purchaser could purchase her baby as well. Um, I was just shocked and appalled by this and wrote a song um, about what it was like, what it might be like for this woman uh, at that time. So... Um, Thank you for the suggestion. Really enjoyed learning more about this artist. Thank you. Here's a little snippet. I've got a baby child. I keep him. Twill come the day when I'll be weeping. How can I love him any less? This little babe upon my chest You can take my body, you can take my bones You can take my blood, but not my soul You can take my body, you can take my bones You can take my blood, but not my soul That was beautiful and powerful. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much, Alex. So as Eric mentioned, this is part two of a podcast on Medicare Advantage. And the first one was a conversation with Dr. Don Berwick and Dr. Rick Gilfillan about Medicare Advantage plans, their history, how they work, uh, potential upsides and potential downsides and policy solutions. And if anyone is interested, there has been a rebuttal piece to their article published in Health Affairs that we will link to in the show notes. But this topic today is a little bit different. So I will start with Cheryl. Could you quickly summarize what a MA plan is and then also what special needs plans are, which is a focus of the talk today? Absolutely. And I suspect most people listening in 
know what an MA plan is, even though they may not use those words. We've used the words like Medicare managed care, Medicare HMO, Mm -hmm. Uh, early 90s. um, Actually, these go back to the 80s. But in the early 90s, I think the mantra was they were neither managed nor care. Um, But (laughs) Medicare Advantage or MA plans have truly exploded for lots of reasons that Don Berwick Uh, described, but also for lots of good reasons, because you have a prepaid or called capitated payment model. So it's not decapitated, but per person per month. And then that gets shared at the health plan level. And sometimes it's done at a capitated level with the docs and other clinicians, or sometimes it's just a discounted fee for service, which is usually not very effective. But that's um, MA in the big picture. About 43% of uh, Medicare eligible adults are now enrolled in an MA plan. And it's particularly attractive for low income individuals because there's often no co-pays, there's often um, little out of pocket expenses or less out of pocket expenses and added benefits. We won't go into all the complicated structures of MAs, but with that lower cost also comes some downsides, a restricted network, So you have to go to the doctors within the contract and some other restrictions in terms of access to services. But what I want to talk about is a subset of MA plans called special needs plans, or sometimes referred to as SNPs. Mm -hmm. Um, When I told my family I was running the SNP Association, I think they thought I was becoming a hairstylist. But (laughs) special needs plans are a subset of MA, and there are three types. The largest one is for those who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. It's predominantly older adults, but there's also younger people disabled. And about a third of people who are enrolled in duly eligible or DSNPs also have a serious mental illness as part of their disability. So a DSNP or duly eligible SNP covers an array of ages and disabilities And there are a little over 3 million people who are enrolled in dual SNPs. The second type of special needs plan is called a C or chronic condition special needs plan. And that's for um, an individual who has one of 17 identified, because we all know there's only 17, right? I'm being facetious, but Mm -hmm. CMS has designated 17 categories and groups of diagnoses that are eligible for these SNPs. And then the third type is I or institutional SNPs, which are, um, the, so the C SNPs are a little over 350,000 enrollees. The I SNPs are around 100,000. They're predominantly in nursing home settings, but we're also starting to see the growth of institutional level SNPs in assisted living in some community housing. So overall, special needs plans are unique because they have additional quality requirements. They have additional requirements in what's called a model of care. So much like a PACE program, you have to describe the population that you're serving, how you're going to serve them, the kinds of providers and networks that you need to serve them. You also need to do an individual um, health risk assessment on an annual basis. Uh, You need to have care coordination as part of it. So it really focuses ideally on that individual who's deemed to be the most frail, the most vulnerable. And And to me, so these are not nirvana. There are goods and bads, and I'm sure we'll go back and forth in the conversation about what are some of the strengths and what are some of the challenges. But to me, it is the opportunity, particularly for geriatric health professionals, to align policy payment and delivery redesign. Because when we have tried to look at systems of care for older adults, we sometimes do one or two, but we need a mechanism that allows for all three of those to work concentrically. And that's truly the way um, special needs plans are intended to be. Can you yeah. give me a couple of examples of uh, like names of special needs sure. plans? Sure. Like- There's some wonderful ones that many of the audience may be familiar with. Commonwealth Care Alliance in Boston mm-hmm. is known for serving high-risk Um, low-income, often um, unhoused people with serious chronic conditions. Mm. They do that through a special needs plan structure. Mm. Um, The SCAN health plan in Southern California that is now rolling out um, a medical 
plan for uh, <clears throat> street medicine for those unhoused individuals. Mm. SCAN does much of their work through a special needs plan structure. Um, those are a couple of um, high level examples. There are special needs plans in 46 states plus a District of Columbia. So I dare say just about wherever you are, there's a special needs plan. Now, some of them may not be as um, effective at targeting the most vulnerable in the group as the two that I mentioned, but many of them are doing remarkable work at a local level. Another good example is UCARE in um, the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, focusing on an incredibly ethnic diverse population um, identifying what are um, community needs for serious chronic illness and doing it through community partners. And they do it in over 30 languages. Mm. So the potential for special needs plans to focus and target and partner with physicians and other community providers is really one of the hallmarks in the strengths of the special needs plan. And, you know, I think it sounded like from our last podcast, you know, there's the potential for this to really impact patients, but there's also seems to be a very big growing interest also from a Wall Street perspective. Is that right? Um, yes, but maybe not so much in special needs plans. Um, certainly, Wall Street is very interested in MA, Medicare Advantage or Medicare yeah. HMO. Um, it takes some effort to put up um, a special needs plan. And the margins are less. So one of the games, and I know that um, Don Berwick and Rick Gelfand referred to this, is that if you have a special needs plan that is a small plan, and because you're dealing with very, very high risk um, individuals, they may be low income, um, com adherence to treatments may be low, they may not score well on quality measures. So you fold that plan into your larger Medicare Advantage plan, where the quality scores are higher, you get more money, yada, yada. So where um, plans have tried to boost their quality scores, um, they've done that through merging plans. One of the concerns that we have is that the measurement of quality, and I know we'll touch on this when we look at um, uh, hospice as well, but the measurement of quality really doesn't get to what is quality for some of the most vulnerable individuals. If you're living under a bridge, yes, colonoscopies are important, but is that how you would measure the quality of your health care? Yeah. Especially if they don't speak your language and you can't access them in any way. Yeah. So I don't know and if that really answered, but so Wall Street is looking, yeah, there's yeah. dollars to be made, but right now there's kind of a dance. And in fact, the new rule just came out or the proposed rule. CMS is trying to pull apart what are special needs plans, or at least the dual special needs plans from the general Medicare Advantage plan so that we can better understand some of this quality measurement. And, and let me ask you, Cheryl, when you read Don Berwick's and Rick's... Uh health affairs article. What do you think of it? Well, first of all, I have huge respect for them both. I've been a groupie of Don's for a long time. I did a quality fellowship at Intermountain and he was one of the faculty. Um, I think it was rather one-sided and I think it overly promoted ACOs. And in full disclosure, they have financial interests in ACOs as well. So, you know, who is really pure in this whole financial um, interest game? Accountable care organizations, just like we could beat up managed care for being neither managed nor care, accountable care organizations were often not accountable, nor did they coordinate care. <laughs> so it really was a game about attribution and how do we control our spending <clears throat> and um, put ourselves in the best risk environment. So both of these are examples of what the worst of incentives can be, but under the positive side for both ACOs and managed care is when you have alignment of payment that is supposed to be accountable for the population that you're serving and you're responsible for both the cost and the quality for those outcomes, you can potentially do a much better job of coordinating that care than you do under a fragmented fee-for-service. And I really like uh, the rebuttal uh, that we'll also have a link in the health, health affairs. The one part of it that I, I thought was a little bit disingenuous was uh, uh, there's a section on the finite number of diagnoses for each person. So during our last podcast, they talked about how Medicare Advantage plans, you know, 
find codes. They find diagnoses. So for example, they gave an example of doing a carotid ultrasound to find asymptomatic carotid disease as a billing code. In the health affairs rebuttal, they said, you know, there, there's a finite diagnosis and that finding diagnosis can actually be very knowledgeable and extremely useful, indeed necessary for optimal care delivery. I think that that's probably true in some ways, but I think we all know, especially in geriatrics, just because you've diagnosed the diagnosis doesn't mean it actually is going right. to improve care. And the older adult is not the sum of their diseases. Yeah. However, yeah. one of the things that Don dismisses, but that we hold as part of a geriatric principle, special needs plans often have care teams that go to the home. Yeah. When they go to the home, they end up finding much more information in doing a, a thorough assessment, including a functional assessment that we as um, geriatric health professionals believe in, will uncover other needs. And that is also code finding. So, you know, if code finding leads to an improved care plan and a person-centered approach to care, then I think it has value to the person. I'm not worried about the health plan. I'm really thinking about the individual we're trying to serve. If just screening for carotid disease um, does nothing to change the outcome, then yeah, you're just mining for dollars. What else is different if I'm a patient in a SNP plan? Because I think for your average person on the street, it's hard to sort of wrap your mind around different payment models in the plans. Oh, so on the ground, what look, looks different? It's insanely hard. So um, it will be a different experience depending on the special needs plan type you have. Let's say you have a um, fully integrated dual special needs plan. You're duly eligible. That means that in the states where those plans exist, and there's 11 states right now, you now functionally have your Medicare and Medicaid under one plan. So you're not having to jostle between Medicaid covers this, Medicare covers that. You have a plan coordinator and a plan oversight that is managing both of those services. If you are in an institutional SNP in a nursing home, instead of a fee-for-service doctor that comes out every 60 days and maybe a nurse practitioner every 30 days, you now have a nurse practitioner that's frequently on site, that's coordinating your care, that may be treating you with in the nursing home community rather than sending you out just to get the three days with a head in the bed and uh, go through the cycle of uh, maximizing your Medicare days. <clears throat> if you have a C-SNP, a chronic SNP, a good example is the AIDS Foundation. Um, this is a C-SNP that's targeting people with um, severe um, HIV AIDS. You now have a care network of both docs and community providers and a process of care and assessments and access to services that you wouldn't find under, you'd have to navigate it on your own under a fee-for-service. So those are three examples of what it might look like. Sorry, I, I had a question, you know, thinking about this and, and how sort of from a patient perspective, how are most patients finding themselves enrolled in SNPs? Um, we know, especially for our seriously ill patient population with dementia, navigating this is terribly different. Is this from advertisements? Are they getting letters? And then what do we know about people leaving? Are they more likely to leave SNPs than other types of MA plans? Um, so a very good question. And one of my frustrations is there's a cacophony out there of people figuring out um, what to do for themselves, their spouses, their loved ones, their parents, um, even PACE that we love. Um, as a geriatrician, a PACE program to me is the model, and yet only 55,000 people are enrolled in PACE programs mm -hmm. around the country, and most people have no idea. They think it's a race car. Compared to about like 4 million almost in SNP, special in needs SNPs. plans. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, so that gives you a relative um, relationship of PACE, Program of All-Inclusive Care of the Elderly and Special Needs Plans. The way most people find them is, frankly, through a broker. That's that person, you know, those 1-800 numbers. Remember the ads that we were so sick of in November and December? Um, Joe Namath and uh, whoever else was sign up, you know, call up for your MA. You can get added benefits. You can this, you can get that. A lot of those were selling DSNPs because they're the largest, most popular. And um, CMS in their proposed rule has said, you know, not all that advertising was necessarily completely transparent and people still didn't know what they were getting. 
So Claire, back to your point, it's still incredibly difficult. In some communities, there is a close partnership with the uh, um, physician groups, the community service networks, and the health plan. And they work together in identifying people appropriate for a special needs plan. But very often, it's by accident or by broker or by word of mouth. Now, most people stay. I can give you um, numbers by plans, but many of the plans are well over 96% retention from year to year. And you know, one thing with the Medicare Advantage plan is that at the end of life, and correct me if I'm wrong, Claire, uh, there is a, a drop off as far as uh, number of rollies. So switching from Medicare Advantage to traditional Medicare. Is that right, Claire? Yeah, so uh, thank you for that introduction to the to the hospice carve out. So there actually is a drop off for two reasons. One is that we know that people at the end of life, in the last year of life, have about double the rate of leaving Medicare Advantage plans in general. Now, this is not SNPs or the minority of MA plans. Right. This is not speaking specifically to SNPs. I'd imagine the data might look different. I'm not sure. But in general... Well, people... Before you go into that, um, is the data, Cheryl... Do we have any data? Because that was one of Claire's questions. Do we have any data on dropout in SNPs? We don't at the end of life. Um, we can look at overall dropout, but that's pretty distorted. And I agree with Claire that um, what, what we need is data on special needs plans, maybe in the last six months or the last year of life. And we right. don't have that data. All right. At least Sorry I about that, Claire. I've been looking for it. That's all right. So there's actually a great um, GAO report. The Government Accountability Office is the, the sort of congressional watchdog. They issue various reports trying to understand spending and quality in, in sort of all areas of government. And they actually had a report come out about the high rates of leaving MA at the end of life and talking about the sort of costs that MA plans, besides the experience of, of the patient and the family, the costs that MA plans are avoiding from people leaving at the end of life when they, they tend to use more health care, they tend to be sort of more expensive to plans. So that's, that's one portion of the population leaving MA plans in general at the end of life. The other larger portion is that um, MA uh, currently has a hospice carve out. In other words, hospice is not covered by someone's MA plan. So if you're a patient and you're enrolled in Medicare Advantage and you elect hospice, what happens is that the majority of your care moves over to, to traditional Medicare or fee-for-service Medicare as part of the hospice program. If you Why? have some <laughs> is that Why? just to make yeah. people's lives much more complex and confusing? <laughs> so it it makes it certainly it certainly makes things more complex. I think the underlying principles, and we'll talk about this more in the in the in what's called the carve in that's being trialed, is this idea that hospice should be available to everyone without the same sort of restrictions and parameters that exist within Medicare Advantage. Well, and if I can jump in, CMS set this up on, uh, on purpose, and it's the same thing with the PACE program. You have to disenroll from PACE to enroll in hospice because CMS believed that we would start double dipping in Medicare benefits. And so it is by structure that you have to disenroll from one Medicare program to get into another which then creates a bizarre set of uh, discontinuous care at the end of life. Why? Why didn't yeah, they just and, say you you have to, um, like it has to be a benefit for Medicare Advantage plans to offer hospice to? Yeah. So 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 first of all, I mean, well, and I guess one one point about the carve out is that it's not a complete carve out of if you have some cost saving benefits, for example, from your MA plan, like maybe under your MA plan you pay less copays for certain things. Those benefits actually do carry over as you transition into uh -huh. hospice. But I think, yeah, as Cheryl was saying, you know, for historical reasons, um, CMS really, really wanted to keep hospice as a separate benefit that was more uniform across all, all people at the end of life. There was also a distrust that people would misuse hospice, which I always found incredibly bizarre. And for those of us now, you guys are all youngsters. I'm grandma here. Um, remember the battles of getting hospice as a provider type and a payment type under uh, Medicare. And the belief was that people would just flood into hospice like everybody was just anxious to die. So they were um, very explicit in creating a separate benefit structure. It had to be equitable and equal to all Medicare beneficiaries, but you couldn't double dip. So right now, if I'm a patient 
in Medicare Advantage, just to make sure that I understand this correctly, and I decide to enroll in hospice, do I completely sever my ties with the Medicare Advantage plan, the doctors that I've gotten to know, and just enroll in hospice? So you, you don't completely sever. So, and then I want to, well, I'll, I'll save that point for a sec, but you don't completely sever. If you have cost saving benefits, um, like reduced co-pays or cost sharing, those stay with you. If you're being treated for conditions that are not related to your terminal diagnosis, that actually still falls under the MA plan. But the majority of your care, the hospice part of your care is provided under fee for service. Now, when we're talking about that transition, it's not like when this happens to patients that they're, you know, going to an office to fill out paperwork. This is really on the administrative side in terms of in terms of plans and and Medicare. Um, it's not that families have to, you know, go through a disenrollment process the same way they do if, let's say, a patient chooses to leave their MA plan. Okay, so that was the carve out. Now there's something called a carve in. So there is a carve-in being tested. So this is under something called VBID, which is the value-based insurance design program. So it is it is the way that CMS is doing this is very, very carefully because many reasons, but in part, there's been a lot of worries from the hospice community about this carve-in and how this will go for our patients. Um, so, so the idea is certain certain hospices and MA organizations, or well, really it's driven by the MA organizations, volunteer to be part of this program, where now hospice is is overseen by the MA plan. And again, that's not that's not for for all MA plans right now. It's really just being trialed in a select number of programs and then it's it's grown already it will continue to grow it's unclear what the timeline is for this to be adopted as a carve out or a, sorry a carbon for everyone um whether whether that will happen and when that will happen is is really um up in the air as well as as well as what it will look like because part of this process is that CMS Medicare is really closely watching what happens um, in terms of extensive survey work and reviews and data collection, as well as reconsidering sort of what does what does this look like um, in terms of other structures of of the carbon. What are you worried about with a carbon? Yeah, so- it feels like to me like hey, like putting it all under one umbrella seems like a, a good idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So so I'm worried about a couple of things. And I think, you know, part of this, it it reminds me of a patient. I was I was on service in our palliative care unit a couple of weeks ago. And um I had a patient who was actually not a managed Medicare plan on a managed Medicaid plan. And um this was this was someone who really had very specific needs at the end of life where they really needed expert, you know, um, IV medications and wound care, a high level of, of, of needs. Um, and they, they also had a primary caregiver in their life who's a, a family member who had really taken on the lion's share of caregiving, was actually providing extensive hours every day of direct care. And this is someone um, who, who lived in the southern part of New York, um, and and also had other caregiving duties, and also was a night shift worker, so working the night shift. And in this managed Medicaid plan, um, the facility that I thought best met the patient's clinical needs, um, and was in reasonable proximity, which I would define as you know an hour drive or an hour ride on the subway, was out of network. Frankly, all the facilities that were nearby and met the patient's needs were out of network. Um, the the really only in network option was several hours of a commute away, um, and so I think in terms of what people are worried about, one part of what people are worried about are networks of hospices and how that will look. So, in the carbon, um, just like in other parts of Medicare Advantage, plans will have networks. So they'll have lists of physicians or home health agencies. They have lists of skilled nursing facilities that patients can go to. That will soon happen with hospices. Um, and and the, the costs may be on the patient more if you choose for an out-of-network hospice agency. So what we know about Medicare Advantage is that 
people in MA, um, the the networks, when you when you compare, even within the same zip codes, there was some great work out of Brown that showed when you compare um, home health agencies that people in MA go to compared to those in traditional Medicare, they go to lower quality home health agencies. They go to lower quality skilled nursing facilities. And that's determined by quality ratings, by the, the star ratings. So I think one of my fears is that same thing will happen with hospice is that MA plans will include in their network hospices who are lower quality. And that's not because they're nefarious, it's because they're motivated by profit. Um, and so hospices that are less that are providing less expensive care that are maybe visiting patients less, they're gonna be more likely to be in network. Um, that is the darkest version of what I'm afraid of. That is my fear. But I think, you know, how do you define an adequate network in terms of in terms of distance from a patient or family member is one question. Another is how do you really measure quality and make sure that quality of care received by hospices and networks is is up to snuff? Yeah, I, I would um, add in that about a third of our SNP Alliance members um, SNP plans are not for profit health plans. And I think it'd be very interesting to look at the community-based or regional-based not-for-profit health plans. So, for example, the Commonwealth Care Alliance, um, Elder Care, uh, Metropolitan Jewish Home in um, in your area, Greater New York, um, the Scan Health Plan. Those are um, health partners. Those are examples. You care. All examples of not-for-profit that um, are also struggling with this hospice relationship for, uh, you know, real reasons and I think sometimes perceived reasons. One question that I have for you, Claire, is what happens to the individual after they die? Under the hospice benefit, there's that entire bereavement package that goes with the family. I'm not sure that goes with the MA contract. That's a good question. Um, I haven't specifically looked into that. I would imagine that the, the bereavement is a required part of the hospice benefit. So I can't imagine CMS would allow it to be dropped from well, MA. except the MA's relationship is with the member. And once the member's gone or dead, um, their relationship is not with the family. So I don't know. I think yeah. that's yet to be determined. I would imagine that that would be on the hospice agency's responsibility, the same way it is under fee-for-service Medicare. Um, but yeah, I, I, I haven't specifically looked into how bereavement would function, but I'd imagine it would be the responsibility of the hospice agency, the way it is now under traditional Medicare. And Cheryl, how are SNPs doing currently with what, what, what are SNPs any different as far as hospice utilization or how they're using it? Well, versus so general another MA way, um, and we didn't talk about this because I didn't want to get too complicated, but um, PACE programs and um, special needs plans have another way of using hospice and that is by subcontracting with them. So instead of disenrolling from the plan and enrolling into the full hospice benefit, the special needs plan can contract with the hospice agency and providers to do the core services. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what many um, special needs plans, particularly that take care of the most vulnerable, frail, older adults with complex needs. So they will work to keep that person within the special needs plans through the trajectory of their end of life journey, but will often use hospice providers, hospice networks and contract with them rather than shifting the entire financial risk under the hospice benefit. Does that make sense? So it, yeah. instead of me giving you the whole bucket, I'm basically paying you to take care of a part of it. Yeah. I think that that brings up sort of another aspect of the carbon, which which could be a positive thing, is that it it gives flexibility to MA plans, um, which SNPs already had a lot more flexibility, um, but to to the remainder of MA plans to provide more sort of palliative care services or hospice like services. So that obviously could be a major benefit in terms of expanding that, and it clearly is an opportunity for growth within our fields. Um, and yet we don't know how that will be used. And I think one concern is, will that be a substitution for hospice when it's seen as less costly, for example, when, when an MA plan doesn't want to pay, you know, the amount they've negotiated with a hospice and network, they could say, no, like they could encourage a patient to instead have 
a, another form of palliative care um, that, that may not be the same in terms of quality. So I think with all of these things, this is the complexity of Medicare Advantage is you know, there, there is great oppor opportunity for quality improvement. There's also a lot of risk for bad yeah. behavior and yeah. financially motivated behavior. Um, I think the SNPs, my guesses are doing, are, are better better for this than other plans, but I think there's probably tremendous variation. Right, um, and, um, and so we, we recognize in all, because frankly, I was involved in overseeing where there was reckless behavior in hospice programs that were for-profit, and, you know, that, 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 that was a whole mess. Um, the palliative care relationship, though, and we know we don't want to mix up the nomenclature that hospice equals palliative care and palliative care equals hospice. Um, I, I think that's one we've all been through and um, the public struggles with. But in the nursing home setting, palliative care is almost non-existent under fee-for-service. There's no mechanism. Um, Diane Meyer and I have talked about this at length. An ISNP now gives a structure to pay for a palliative care team because you have a capitated prepaid model. It makes financial interest to the health plan because it's um, better care at the appropriate setting and not relying on um, acute care for symptom management, but it's better care for the individual, but you now have a mechanism to do that. So I think what, um, if I can put words into Claire's mouth, but I think both of our expressions are when you use a model for its financial advantages to the extremes, the person loses, the payer wins. When you use payment models that truly optimize a coordinated person-centered care delivery design, the person wins. And very often it is a capitated, which frankly, that's what hospice is, or a managed care model that says, we're going to use some aggregate dollars here to do the best thing at the right setting at the right time for the right person. I think it's up to us as healthcare professionals to be part of that conscience and to be expressive in both policy, but also in the care delivery side, that if we don't have strong advocates, business wins. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, in thinking about the the incentives, the incentives really, really show us where to go here. And there's there's a great um Joan Tino blog, and I think it was the the JAMA Health Services Journal. Um, but but it it was um I'm gonna butcher this, but the the bank robber quote of you know w Willie Sutton, yes. Thank you. Yeah, the, the Sutton quote of, you know. Uh, you follow the money, right? And 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 I I think that in thinking about incentives, what we know about quality of care at the end of life really perfectly aligns with what you would expect from incentives. So, for example, one quality measure we think of a lot is use of intensive services like ICU stays and hospitalization. Well, it turns out those are also really expensive types of care. So MA plans are really really good at avoiding hospital use and ICU stays. We see this, there's a JAG study, a Joan Tino JAG study looking at this. Um, ACOs did nothing, but, but MA plans really reduced rates of hospitalization and ICU care among older adults in nursing homes with dementia. Um, the, 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 the areas of quality that I, I worry about more are things where higher cost care is also higher quality. So thinking about even within hospice, MA plans are very good at getting people into hospice because at this point they're carved out. Those tend to be high cost individuals where they do not enroll in hospice. So they're great at that. Um, but I really worry about things like visits in the home. We know hospices themselves, as, as Cheryl was saying, especially for-profit hospices have unfortunately displayed patterns such as not making visits at the end of life. And visits are expensive. Visits are just staffing, right? And staffing is 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 expensive. And so things like that, that, you know, maybe they don't save, they may be costly for MA plans to provide, but they also provide better care for patients and their families. I worry about those. And I think those are the areas we really have to target quality measurement. And how good is that data and how transparent is the data around these outcomes within MA plans? Terrible and not. <laughs> and we don't have the right measures. So we're relying, yes. <laughs> we're relying on HEDIS measures, which again, I already talked about how, yeah, that's wonderful for a younger commercial population. It was totally inappropriate for a vulnerable complex needs end of life care patient. Yeah. 
Um, we also rely on self-report tools that I'll throw out there are worse than useless because they are not in your language. They ask insane questions like, do you still bowl, uh, go bowling? Many of our patients never went bowling, don't know what bowling <laughs> is. And if you're dying, that's probably not your number one um, question. And, and then you get a small, 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 small number of responses, and then you make extrapolations to an entire plan, and then you pay them based on that. But we aren't asking questions about social determinants. We aren't asking questions about what their values and priorities for end of life are if they are in that category. We're not asking functional questions. So even if we were transparent with the quality measures that we have, I think they're useless for this population. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the Viva, the, sorry, that's the trial of the carbon. They're really trying to make work and um, to make progress in improving these measures and specifically expanding a post-death interview um, of of uh, the, the family and friends of beneficiaries who die, um, which is something that happens in the hospice program to really get sort of more relevant, tested, you know, high quality, directly um, relevant to end of life care measures. Um, but, but quality is an issue, and this is where I know we started talking about diagnosis inflation, but diagnosis inflation also makes this really hard because you want to adjust for the severity of the illness, even, even in patients in the end of life. And if you have inflated diagnoses, it's really, it does make quality measurement also very challenging to compare apples to apples um, across different patient populations. Okay, right, Claire, I'm going to go to you. The final questions. I got two different questions for each of you. Sorry, Cheryl. I don't. You're, you're not going to get a magic wand, but I got a different question for you. Okay. Um, okay, Claire. You got a magic wand around hospice carvings, but what we should do in the future? What's the path forward? What are you going to use that magic wand for? <laughs> Yeah, so my magic wand is the thing I just talked about. I would, I would love, frankly, I would love this across all beneficiaries in in Medicare. I think we need to survey family and friends, the closest proxy after everyone dies, not just those in hospice, um, to get direct patient reported feedback on quality of care. So kind of like what the VA it. does. There's the brief family survey. Exactly. You know, it's not everybody who dies, it's people who die in the hospital or home based primary yep. care but really doing a brief family survey on everybody. Yes, exactly like what the VA does. Yep. All right, sure. Cheryl, I guess I got, I got, I got a, I'm going to give you one quick magic wand. If you had a magic wand, what would you use it on? So it would be on measurement. And what I would like, we don't want to adjust uh, for poor quality uh, based on poverty or other disparities, but if we could have substitute measures for subset populations, and we could test them in the yeah. populations that we're serving. Right now, we have neither. Yeah, not just for those who like bowling. Right? Yeah. Not just for those who like bowling. <laughs> All right, Claire. I got one last question. I mean, Cheryl, one last question for you. Um, uh, you've got a lot of trainees listening to this, healthcare fellows, geriatric fellows. Why should they consider working for a special needs plan? Because in many ways, let's go back to why PACE. You have identified a high-risk population, which is part of what is our passion. You are working more closely with a health plan in a way that is person-centered and targeted. And you're accountable for that whole person, not just for their disease state. So to me, it is the primary care of health plans is you're focusing on the entire person. And is there a website I can go to to learn more about special well, needs there plans is. or like an alliance of them? There is. Um, www.snp for SNP Alliance.org. And um, if anybody wants to reach out to me individually, I'm happy to share. But I am passionate that this is an opportunity for geriatric health professionals to have a voice in how um, care is delivered for some of the most vulnerable older adults we serve. And I love seeing your dog walk behind you. What's your dog's name? Oh, that is, well, Bodacious Argus Lat or Bodie. I wanted to name <laughs> him Bodie name. with both face, but I lost. <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you for joining us. I learned a ton today. You know, if you asked me, you know, in November of last year, what a SNP plan was, I thought it would be something about vasectomies. Um, <laughs> so... I, I think I have a much better idea uh, now. But before we end, Alex, you want to give us a little bit more? What's what's the what's Not the, the band? purchaser's option by Rihanna Rihanna Giddens? Okay. Um, here's a little bit more. Thanks. Day 
by day I work the line Every minute over time Fingers nimble, fingers quick Fingers bleed to make you rich You can take my body, you can take my bones You can take my blood, but not my soul You can take my body, you can take my bones You can take my blood, but not my soul Cheryl, Claire, Alex, big, big, big thank you for joining us today. That was a great podcast. I uh, really appreciate it. Bye, guys. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much for the invitation. And a uh, big thank you, Archstone Foundation, for your continued support. We'd also like to thank our listeners who are supporting the Jerry Pell podcast at at least the $250 level. And those include Meg Wallhagen, Thomas Quinn, Rochelle Bernacki, Louise Aronson, James Tulsky, Arden O'Donnell, Mike Steinman, Marianne Forcia, Ashok Krishnaswamy, Nancy Lundeberg, and Gail Cooney. And to all of our listeners for supporting the Jerry Pell podcast. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.